If you want to make great progress, you need a great practice strategy. Or a montage. Let's talk strategy. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace. And if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses, please do subscribe and be sure to hit the like button to make your practice 10% more efficient. Now today we're talking about practice strategies, how to optimize and get the most out of your practice. And I'm also gonna talk about a lot of frequently asked questions I hear from my students. Now today for our examples in how to practice, we're gonna be using the assignment for March in the free fundamentals course. You can join us at any time, jump to March or start from the beginning. I'll put a link down below, jump on in and download the free goodies. Now the reason I've created specific monthly assignments is to take as much guesswork out of the practice process as possible, but there's still a lot to meet a lot of levels of playing, so it can be overwhelming. So let's break it down and talk about three core strategies to optimize your practice. Strategy number one, clarify the result you're after. Set not only a goal for each practice session, but micro goals within each practice session so you know if you're hitting your objectives or not. So if you set your daily goal as get good, it's a little too broad and gonna be hard to hit. I've been trying for years. So you might think, okay, let's make it learn this month's etude. Better, but still too broad. It's more than most of us can accomplish in one practice session. But what if we chose the first 16 bars of the etude? That's gonna be a much more manageable chunk that you can easily accomplish for most of us in one practice session. And when you have that specific goal in your practice session, you can kind of put your blinders on, really dig in without getting overwhelmed by all the things we need to learn when learning to master the saxophone. You have your goal, it's specific, and you know if you're working on that day's objective or not can really help eliminate a lot of overwhelm and keep you on the path to your specific larger term goal. And likewise, set micro goals within each of the other exercises you've chosen to practice that day. So rather than just playing long tones or tone studies, as in our monthly assignments, you might choose an interval or two that are giving you some problems, something where you don't like the tone. Then we can apply the overtones we've been doing to isolate an interval and really work on the tone of one specific key area of a tone or melodic study. And the same thing goes for scales. I recommend when you practice scales, you do it cumulatively, meaning when you're learning a new key, you brush up on the other scales you've already learned. But within that, we still wanna set a micro goal for that day. So for instance, I'm working on D major in fourths, so I can demonstrate it for you, my students. The turnaround up top is a little tricky if you haven't practiced it in a while. So I might make my micro goal within my scales to work just on the couple of bars of that top turnaround of D major and fourths. So set your daily goal that's gonna work you towards your longer term monthly goal, and within each day's practice, set micro goals for each of the exercises so you make sure you're getting the most out of your practice and aiming for mastery of the instrument, not just playing through exercises. Strategy number two, plan your practice in advance. We wanna know our monthly, weekly, and daily goal objectives before we ever step foot into the practice room and write them down and bring that into the practice room with you. In each session, we wanna make sure we're covering the three core pillars of saxophone mastery, sound, technique, and musicality. And you wanna know what you're gonna be working on in each area, and our monthly assignments have tried to clarify this before you ever step foot into the practice room, or garage, or wherever it is that you practice. 
Then you wanna plan how much time you're gonna be spending in each of those areas. We'll get more to that in a minute. But that's gonna help us preventing getting lost in one exercise. When I was a freshman music major, I had a practice room that I would reserve with a huge, beautiful window overlooking North Campus in Athens, Georgia. It was a really nice place to practice, and I would zone out while playing long tones and overtones, and then I would realize I was late for my music theory class, and I had not touched the etude that I had to play for my professor later that day. So planning on how much time you're gonna spend on each aspect will help keep you on track, make sure you're not neglecting any area of your practice. Now, when you're working on sound technique and musicality in every practice session, it may feel like you're making a little bit slower progress than the guy that's working on nothing but technique every practice session. But remember, our goal is mastery of the instrument, not to be the guy with the fastest hot licks at the jam session. That guy's name's Gary, and Gary's life is a hot mess. Maybe if you spend a little time working on tone, Gary, then Linda wouldn't have left you. We'll never know. So plan it out. If you have an hour to practice, spend about 20 minutes on sound development. Spend 20 minutes on technique in isolation and 20 minutes working on musicality, your etude or prepared piece for that week. Break it into roughly equal parts is a good general rule of thumb to start with. Now, if you have a longer practice session than an hour, then do math. I don't like math, so you do the math, not me. Strategy number three, track your time and tempos. Now, I'm gonna be working on a practice log sheet for Academy members, but in the meantime, feel free to use any cheap notebook you can find or a piece of paper as long as you keep track of it. We wanna track the time we're planning on spending, our goals, how much time we actually spend on them, and the tempos as we go along. Now, I'm a big fan of cheap analog wristwatches, but if you're going to use an electronic device to keep track of how much time you're spending on each exercise in the practice room, please do put your tablet or phone in airplane mode. It takes a lot of discipline to ignore notifications more than I have. Now, if the notification is from my wife, I will obviously check it every time, even when I'm practicing. Don't tell her otherwise. This also helps make sure we're taking a rounded approach to our playing. We're always working on sound. We're always spending time on technique and we're always spending time on the musicality, our etudes, our prepared pieces. And we won't be like that guy at the gym that only works on biceps, but you can't climb a flight of stairs. We wanna be well-rounded in tracking your time, making sure you're covering each major area of sound, technique, and musicality is gonna help you do that. So not only tracking the amount of time you're spending in each area, but write down the tempo where you left for that day. The tempo right where you're at the breaking point, you reached it, but just barely you've stretched yourself. Then the next day you can look at that tempo and back it off, 10 or 20% of whatever tempo you're at. A couple of clicks on the metronome, no big deal, to make sure you can start in a nice relaxed fashion, work back up to that gold tempo, and then see if you can stretch it past that. So keep track of your tempos, the amount of time you're practicing, and that should all be under the category of your daily goal and objectives. Now, we're not gonna cover montage practice today, but I do love the 1980s, where movie montages really hit their stride. So instead, let's take something else from the 80s, turbocharging. Everything was turbo in the 1980s. So here are three turbo tips to make your practice neon colored and super rad. Number one, make your practice fun. Remember fun? I remember fun. We can all start to take this too seriously. And if you take the saxophone too seriously, it's a great way to kill a perfectly good hobby. So yes, I try to work towards mastery and I have my students working towards mastery to become the greatest musicians and saxophonists they are capable of becoming. But if it's not fun, you're kind of missing the point because playing the saxophone isn't really a living for hardly anyone any longer, certainly not during the pandemic. So it should be fun. If you don't like the assignments I've assigned or what your teacher is assigning, do something fun. Play Disney melodies, play polkas. I don't care what you play. Just make sure you're carving out time at least once a week, maybe every practice session where you're doing something you enjoy just for fun. It's okay, I promise. Turbo tip number two, metronome. Put it on, leave it on, always. Turbo tip number three, prepare your space and materials before your practice session. I swear I get 10 times more done when my studio is clean, it allows the mind to focus. So print off the materials you need, put fresh batteries in the old metronome, and have everything ready to go before you step into the practice room, removing that resistance and distraction. You'll get a lot more done. Now let's hit some frequently asked questions 
from members of the Saxophone Academy. I posted this question in the Saxophone Academy Coffee House, our free kind of online forum to discuss weekly topics. You're free to join. It's open to all members of the Academy. And here are some of the most frequently asked questions. Question number one, how do I practice in small spaces or apartments with neighbors or family nearby? Good question. Communication is key. Simply tell your neighbors you're part of the Saxophone Academy and Dr. Wally demands you practice and find out what their schedule is. The more you communicate, the more you get to know them, the more you make friends with your neighbors, the more likely you're gonna be able to work something out and figure what hours are gonna work for both of you. And most cities and apartment complexes do allow the practicing of musical instruments within a certain set of hours. So look at your city ordinances and make sure you make friends with your neighbors. Communicate what you need. You might be surprised how adaptive people are, especially if you bring them cookies. Number two, how many hours a day or a week should I be practicing? Well, that's not really something I can answer for you. It's highly individual depending on your goals and your life circumstance. As a music major, I would practice three to four hours a day. As a dad homeschooling during the pandemic, 30 to 45 minutes a day is what I have. So I try to make the most of that. If you have a full-time job and kids, don't stress yourself over, I have to do two or three hours a day to make any progress. That's simply not True, one hour a day, you can make enormous progress. And if you only have a half hour a day, do your best with that. Just try to cover a little bit of each of the three pillars of mastery every single day. But don't stress or compare yourself to other people with more time on their hands. You can make a lot of progress with a little bit of time if you're organized. Number three, how do I know when it's time to move on for an etude or exercise? How do you know when you're done, you're ready to start learning the next one? Again, that's hard for me to answer without having heard you play, and it's really best done under the direction of a qualified teacher. But beyond that, have you learned the lesson from the exercise or etude? It doesn't need to be perfect before you move on, but have you gained some mastery of technique? Is your sound improving? Have you gotten the style or the articulation a little bit better? You may be able to move on if you've spent several weeks on one exercise. Perhaps most importantly, if you're getting frustrated, burnout, or bored, feel free to move on past there. You can always go back and look at old etudes and exercises. I do this all the time with fresh eyes and a fresh skill set, and you'll get new lessons from that material. So don't stay on anything too long, but make sure you stay on it long enough to get the lesson out of it. Which doesn't really answer the question, but that's where good teachers come into play. Find a good local teacher, there's just no substitute. Number four, when slowing down an exercise, how slow do I go? Very slow. Number five, when's the best time to practice? When my wife allows me to. For me, personally, for you, life circumstances may dictate that. If you can practice before work and you're fresh and you're awake, that's great. If you're a night owl and you can practice without your neighbors complaining, do that. We each have certain biorhythms and peak times when we're most productive, but again, life gets in the way. For me, 9 a.m. is the perfect time to practice. I'm awake, I've had coffee, I can focus. It's also the time I need to be homeschooling my kids. So some days I can rearrange and make that happen. Other days I can't. Be gentle with yourself. Be patient, especially during the pandemic for a lot of us homeschooling kids. And practice when you can. But try to notice what time of day you're practicing and if you feel focused and relaxed or if you feel stressed and distracted and see if you can move it to the appropriate time. But for most of us, life circumstances kind of dictate that pocket of time we have to practice. Don't stress. Number six, where should I practice? Well, if you have a choice in the matter, try to set up a dedicated space, whether it's an actual room, your garage, if it's heated or cooled, or even a corner of a room where you can leave your stuff set up. I find the acoustics aren't nearly as important as having a dedicated space where you don't have to feel like you have to unpack and set up a whole bunch of stuff every time you practice. It just creates more resistance to the idea of practicing and you'll actually practice less. So don't stress so much about the type of space or the acoustic properties of that space, but just try to have a dedicated space where you can more or less leave things set up. Unless you have two young kids at home, then God help you. Number seven, how do you find practice time when you have young kids at home? I've actually solved this problem, kind of. What I do is I starve them for screen time. I make sure during the day we start with reading and playing and outdoor time, and I don't let them see a television screen or iPad for hours and hours and hours and hours. And then when I'm ready to practice, I will give them their free time, put a snack in front of them, and then I have 45 minutes to make videos like this. 
My kids are on iPads right now. I'm gonna practice for a few minutes after this video, starve them for screen time, and then reward them, and then run and go practice. So let me know what questions I didn't cover and what questions you have in the comments below. I'll be back next week with some very specific overtone exercises to turbocharge your tone. We'll probably won't use 80s analogies next week, but it'll be overtones and it'll be good stuff. So stay tuned and in the meantime, go practice, but enjoy it.